generally, when I stand up to defend the American interpretation of free speech, I'm among friends of the American interpretation of free speech. That wasn't true when I spoke a few years ago in Hungary. I was very surprised to find so little enthusiasm for my side of this question until someone pointed out, Janusz Kish pointed out, that memory, just the sense in one's bones of what is associated with hate speech is going to make a tremendous amount of difference. I understand that. I understand the European sense just as part of collective folk memory of the association between the worst crimes, among the worst crimes in human history and the most offensive speech in human history. But I want nevertheless to suggest to you that the hate speech laws of the European sort that Jeremy described, that is laws that say, I'm, I'm now ignoring differences, laws that make it criminal to insult hatred, to promote contempt and ridicule directed at groups defined by race, religion, or ethnicity, I'm urging that these laws should be repealed. I don't think that it's so clear that the laws are as they read and as Jeremy summarized. Francis Stergestead last night gave me a copy of <coughs> the new Article 100 of the Norwegian Constitution, which in my view, as I would interpret it, really makes unconstitutional the Norwegian statute that Jeremy described. Nor do I think that it's all that clear that the Race Relations Act, Article 4 in Britain, is constitutional if you take Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Freedom of Expression article, to be part of the law. Now that is a statement as to how I understand the law. It's not a prediction as to how it will be understood by judges or other officials. There are three, I think, preliminary points that I'd want to make about the statutes, the European statutes that I just summarized and that Jeremy described, assuming that they are upheld as constitutional. The first is that they do not require drawing the lines that American constitutional law requires. The European courts do not have to decide whether burning a cross on your lawn, painting a swastika on the side of your own house, presenting a sign Arabs go home, and a street where a father walking with his child must encounter it. That is part of the American debate. Where do we draw the line? It is not part of the debate within Europe because the debate within Europe, the laws within Europe, do not require to make something criminal any form of confrontation. They make criminal statements written in books or on the internet which are not, do not impose involuntary confrontation. Nobody has to read the books by David Irving that say the Holocaust was invented by the Jews. Second point, which it's important to bear in mind, is that though these laws talk about incitement, it is not part of the offense that there has to be an actual causal impact of the writing. If there had to be, the statute would have to say, 
How many people have to be moved to contempt? What degree of contempt? Now, these statutes must be interpreted simply as forbidding the expression of an opinion. And the third point to bear in mind is that there is, to my mind, no evidence that societies that have laws of this kind, restricting free speech in this way, thereby and for that reason, have less race crime, hate crime, or indeed that these societies are societies in which people are protected, members of minorities are protected more from knowledge that they are disliked and hated in the community. Race <coughs> crimes, hate crimes, in the United States have been decreasing steadily over the years. I've been very encouraged, I should say, by yesterday's <coughs> presentations, which suggested to me, as one speaker put it, the news is not all bad. But in the United States, statistics demonstrate that hate crime is decreasing. The European Union says that hate crime steadily increases in Europe year by year. Now, we have to be very careful about drawing any conclusions. There are differences, manifold differences, that could explain this without saying that <coughs> speech codes, hate speech laws, don't have any effect on hate crime. But there is no evidence that they do have effect on hate crime, or that they do have effect, actually, on animosity or assurance. These are empirical questions about which we know very little. Now let me give you, I think we ought to have examples of what kind of speech these laws do prohibit. Consider the following statement. Atheists have no reason to be moral or indeed no guidance as to what it is to be moral. Atheists should not be treated as citizens. Statement of John Locke, the father of tolerance. The, when asked, are atheists full citizens? My former president, the first President Bush said, citizens? No, I don't think so. Atheists can't be citizens of the United States. <laughs> In any full sense, this is one country under God. Don't you, don't you know the Pledge of Allegiance, he said. The president of Harvard University in the middle of the last, little before the middle of the last century said the following. Jews, well, they're pushy, they're clubby, they're bookish. Yes, I concede they're bright but they have no taste for manly outdoor sports. <laughs> they don't have, we have to take some at Harvard, <laughs> just to quiet people. And you know the effect on fundraising. But we need Jewish quotas. If any of you have a chance, you might have a look one day at Judge Learned Hand's public statement, open letter to the president of Harvard in response to that statement. Now, here's another one which I've, I've written down to make sure I get this right. What has been the history of Christianity? More or less, in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy ignorance and servility in the laity, in both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Statement by the most intelligent of our founding fathers of the American Constitution, James Madison, who offered this argument as a reason for not allowing an established church in the United States. We must have a separation between church and state 
because Christians, not all of them, but in the main, by and large, ignorant and superstitious people. <laughs> now, of course, that's not what we're thinking about today. Here's, uh, Mr. Chairman, I take it this is a privileged occasion because I'm about to break the law <laughs> <laughs> on almost anybody's understanding of it. Blacks, yes, look, we, it's undeniable that black men, young black men, commit a disproportionate amount of the crime in the United States. <coughs> we also have statistics which demonstrate that blacks have, certain exceptions of course, lower IQ than whites. Now, we don't know whether there's a genetic basis for this. It's too early in the study of genetics to rule it out. But it would be silly not to take this into account in the design of our policies. So of course we shouldn't prohibit police from what's called racial profiling. They encounter a black man in suspicious circumstances. They don't give him the benefit of the doubt because statistics show he's more likely than a white person to be a criminal. We should not have affirmative action programs because they're a waste of time. Our black citizens should be encouraged to go to athletic academies. All right, another example. The culture of Western Europe, the by and large Christian culture, has given us the Renaissance and a continuing flow of great art, literature, science. The Muslim world has not. The reason lies in the religion to which most Muslims subscribe. This is a religion that preaches ignorance, misogyny, war, violence. Of course, not everybody who comes from a Muslim background suffers from these. Of course not. But those who claim to be devout in the Muslim religion do. And of course, this should have an impact on our immigration policy. Now, these are not, I've given you statements, I've tried to make them as vile as I could <laughs> with, because I want them to be clearly violations of the statutes as commonly understood. They are offensive, they're hateful, they're also ignorant. They are based on preposterous assumptions. Why shouldn't we declare illegal making such a statement? Why shouldn't we try and promote as a public good try and promote as part of the environment as we put machines on our exhaust to cut down on smog, why shouldn't we gag people like exhaust pipes on cars from spewing this kind of filth? Well, there are many reasons why not, but I'm going to concentrate on what I take is what I take really is a very powerful argument, and I haven't heard yet, though I will probably, an answer to it. We, faced with what we were calling all day yesterday and this morning, a multicultural society, in which certain races and minorities are vulnerable, we want to protect them. And we want to protect them through law. We want to adopt strong anti-discrimination statutes, which make it illegal to discriminate in hiring or housing. We want to forbid practices like racial profiling. We want to actively promote, we want to ban quotas 
in universities. On the contrary, we want to promote policies that bring more minorities into professions and otherwise into positions of honor in the society. We want to do all that, and we want to do it through law. And when the bigots and the racists say to us, we hate these laws. It's not fair to impose them on us. They go against everything we believe in. How can you justify imposing these on us? We want to reply, this is a fair democratic society. These laws have been adopted through fair procedures. They represent the convictions, settled convictions of the majority after a fair political process, and you are bound by them. And we do not want minority, we do not want the racist minority, because of course it is a small minority. We do not want that minority in a position to say, but the procedure was not fair. Because you did not allow us to give voice to our convictions, even to give voice to them in publications or on the internet making plain our reasons, the vile statements that I described a few moments ago, were aimed to combat legislation. They were aimed as arguments in the democratic process. It would not have been fair, we would have forfeited democratic legitimacy had we denied racists a vote. Denying them a voice is as much an infirmity in the democratic process as denying them a vote. Now, I have to make clear that I am not saying that if we have hate speech laws or otherwise have censorship, then the racists would be justified in revolution. No, there are all kinds of tyrannies that corrupt democracy. Some of them are very bad, they're big tyrannies. In the United States now, the role of money in our politics is a serious infirmity. But democratic legitimacy is a matter of degree, and we don't have to say the bigots would be entitled to revolt before we can say this is a little tyranny. This is a kind of stain on the process, and we should see whether we can do without it. Now, Jeremy said a few minutes ago that dignity is at stake. Public, a public good of assurance is at stake. It is a very important question what we should take dignity to be and mean in a democracy. Dignity is not a psychological state. It's a normative ideal. It's something that we must work out. We must work it out as a conception of the kind of dignity which we should encourage and which we should represent as a virtue in a democracy. To my mind, this democratic dignity begins with what people ought to insist upon as a political standing, a matter of political standing, constitutional dignity. Everyone within the dominion of a political society is entitled and must, as a matter of dignity, insist upon equal concern equal hearing, equal participation. That is what we deny, what hate speech deny the, the bigots. But that is what dignity requires, that we each and for himself and each for all other members insist upon a vote, concern with one's fate. It's a matter of the relationship 
between an individual member of the community and the community, that is, everyone else personified, personified in the exercise of coercive power. That's the positive side of democratic dignity. Now, democratic dignity ought not to be constructed so that we put our self-respect as a hostage, we mortgage out our self-respect to the opinions of others. On the contrary, it flows from the positive side of democratic dignity that we accept that there are people with whom we act together in democratic processes who don't like us and indeed have contempt for us and indeed ridicule us. I agree with Jeremy that to ban offense would be to strike at the heart of democracy. I don't accept that we can distinguish between assaults on dignity and contempt or offense. The statements that I made earlier don't, my fearful statements, didn't deny anybody a role in the political process. It didn't deny anyone the status of a human being. They were aimed at contingent matters of personality. And to live in a democracy is simply to accept that an insult of that character compromises the dignity of the insulter, not his target. You may say you undoubtedly think it's easy enough for me standing here to say that. Yes, I accept that point. What do we do about it? We work in politics in the ways I described earlier. We strengthen anti-discrimination laws. We punish crimes motivated by hate more severely and crimes motivated in other ways. We go out of our way to prevent any exercise of discrimination in the police process, the criminal justice process. We worry about the statistics that show that more young black men are convicted of crime. But we take that to be a problem and a challenge, and we try and legislate in ways that will help. Above all, though this doesn't apply as much in welfare in Norway as elsewhere, above all, we concentrate on the economics of race. We concentrate on the fact that those minorities most vulnerable socially are also most vulnerably economically, and we work towards a fairer distribution, a more just economy. We do all this. It's our agenda. The last thing we need is a moral stain on that agenda. The last thing we need is to compromise the democratic power, the democratic legitimacy of that agenda. We don't have to. If I'm right, and the statistics certainly don't contradict this, we can do all this without the benefit of corrupting our democracy. That agenda is what we should pursue. We can afford to do it democratically. Let's do it democratically.